Hello, my name is Sybil Schaefer. I am the Digital Preservation Librarian and Chronopolis Program Manager at the UC San Diego Library. And my talk is titled, Climate Change Means Change, Long-Term Planning for Long-Term Preservation. Last September, the global air temperature was so abnormally high, around 1.8 degrees warmer than the pre-industrial average, that climate, climate scientist Zeke Hausfather called it gobsmackingly bananas. In fact, you may have noticed it being extraordinarily hot where you are. Depending on how your newsfeed is configured, you may have noticed that heat-related headlines have been present for the entire past year, cycling from the Northern Hemisphere in the summer of 2023 to the Southern Hemisphere for their summer, and now back again. Seems everywhere in North America, even Alaska, is experiencing a heat wave. This heat trend is actually a streak of 12 months in which temperatures have been higher than ever before in previously recorded history. Since July of 2023, we have reached or gone over the 1.5 degree warming threshold as illustrated by the red line in this graph. This threshold is an important marker set in 2015 when leaders from around the world signed the Paris Agreement, which states that it is critical to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial average. It should be mentioned that El Nino started last year, a weather pattern generally associated with hotter temperatures and which may be the cause of some, but not all, of this increase in heat, especially as it is considered to have only been a moderate strength El Nino. As we move into La Nina, cooler temperatures are expected to be on the way. Although they have yet to come. Currently, we are well into the neutral phase of the El Nino Southern Oscillation climate pattern, and we've had two record-breaking days this past week, July 21st and 22nd. They each consecutively set the record for the hottest day ever recorded, which was previously set last July. This chart illustrates that the 10 highest global average temperatures have all occurred within the last decade. Although the heat has made headlines across the world for over a year now, there's a serious dearth of attention being paid to as why it is so hot. Author Jeff Goodall in Rolling Stone asks, does anyone care that the climate crisis is cooking the planet faster than expected? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, averages temperatures over 20 or 30 years. So while we have not yet surpassed the 1.5 degrees Celsius benchmark set during the Paris Agreement negotiations, there is growing consensus that we are in the realm of 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. The IPCC originally predicted we would hit this benchmark sometime between 2030 and 2052 if we continued on with business as usual and did not reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. James Hansen is a renowned climate scientist, perhaps best known for his landmark testimony in Congress in the late 1980s on the dangers of global warming, thus bringing it to the attention of the public for the first time. In contrast to the IPCC's predictions, Hansen published an article last fall which claims that we will exceed 1.5 degrees warming this decade and two degrees before 2050. On the left is a chart which shows atmospheric carbon dioxide measurements since 1960. The levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are no, now more than 50% higher than pre-industrial times. On the right is a chart of the carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels and industry. Except for the dip which occurred during the 2020 pandemic, emissions have continued to grow. Humans have generated an estimated 1.5 trillion tons of carbon dioxide pollution, much of which will continue to warm the atmosphere for thousands of years. The heat that we are currently dealing with is likely here to stay, and we haven't even reached peak emissions yet. Peak emissions being the point at which the graph on the right starts to dip down, and which hopefully the graph on the left starts to flatten out. We've had a burst in renewable energy creation, so why hasn't it helped reduce our emissions? It appears that, as you can see in this chart, 
Oil, coal, and gas are still the predominant sources of energy that we use, and we are increasing, not decreasing, our consumption of these resources. Renewable energy sources such as wind and solar are also growing, but as long as our fossil fuel usage is increasing, it becomes more and more difficult to build enough renewable infrastructure to replace fossil fuels. So what happens as the world warms? Extra heat in the atmosphere causes increased sea levels, higher ocean temperatures, increased risk of wildfires, extreme and more frequent weather events and disasters, droughts and water scarcity, the collapse in ecosystems of, and biodiversity as plants and animals can't adapt quickly enough, disruptions in food production and distribution, particularly through weather affecting growing seasons or crops. Mass migration of people leaving areas that are affected by these factors, disruption in global financial markets, and finally, an increase in conflict and political upheaval. According to the IPCC, every increment of global warming will intensify and multiply and will intensify multiple and concurrent hazards. In addition to climate change, human activities are threatening planetary processes that regulate the stability and resilience of the Earth system. Researchers at the Stockholm Resilience Center have developed a planetary boundary model to help us visualize the areas in the biosphere that have been affected by our excess consumption and our overuse of resources. According to their model, climate change is only one planetary boundary we've crossed. The model also tracks water usage, land system changes like deforestation, ocean acidification, biosphere integrity like bio biological diversity and loss of species, biogeochemical flows, which includes the movement of things like phosphorus and nitrogen used in agriculture into the ocean, and novel entities, which includes the accumulation of things like microplastics and man-made chemicals in the environment. Each of these boundary areas has associated control variables, which were chosen because together they provide an effective way to track the human caused shift away from Holocene environmental conditions. To date, we have exceeded six of the nine planetary boundaries. So what does this mean for, what does climate change and the transgression of other planetary boundaries mean for cultural heritage organizations? Well, for starters, we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, so as not to make matters worse. There are resources out there, such as the Sustainable Libraries Initiative, which can help you get started in improving your library's overall sustainability. But the thing is, no matter how much we reduce our future emissions, we have to deal with the heat that we have already, and that's likely to increase as emissions, emissions continue unabated and tipping points are reached. We need to honestly assess how climate change is going to affect our ability to fulfill our missions and act accordingly. We need to adapt to an uncertain future. There's no doubt that climate change will affect many, if not all aspects of our operations. However, digital materials are especially at risk due to their dependencies on energy, software, and hardware. At its heart, Digital preservation is risk assessment. We evaluate the likely, what the likelihood of certain risks occurring is and then implement strategies to mitigate them. These are the commonly understood threats to digital materials that we try to mitigate. I'll be discussing them more in the next slide. So I took the list of common threats to digital preservation and mapped the effects of climate change to each one. This isn't necessarily exhaustive, but it provides a glimpse of potential future difficulties in preserving materials. The first listed threat is software and hardware obsolescence. Hardware obsolescence is often tackled by refreshing the hardware at the end of its service life, which entails transferring the data from old storage to new storage. A recent RAND report indicated that hardware manufacturing was one of the most likely national critical functions to have major disruptions due to climate change by 2050. Disruptions so significant they could make other critical functions and in industries non-viable. Network failures are also at risk. There are miles of coaxial internet cables that will be flooded with sea level rise. Transcontinental cables are also expected to be 
affected by increased storm activity, especially the landing stations, and a dependency on the electrical grid also increases the likelihood of network outages. Increase of conflict and political upheaval could increase the number of external attacks on a system. A recent study found that the world economy is committed to an income reduction of 19% within the next 26 years, independent of future emission choices due to damages from temperature and precipitation. We are already spending billions of dollars annually on natural disasters. As we spend more money on climate change damages, we have less money for things like curation activities, which are essential not only for providing the contextualization of our digital materials, but transparency, discovery, and access. Our organizations are also becoming increasingly at risk for disruption or failure. And finally, loss of will refers to the will to preserve materials. This could be because it becomes too expensive to preserve, or its value is not well articulated enough, or because there are too many other priorities. Now that I've outlined the problem statement that global warming is happening faster than expected and will affect our ability to preserve materials, particularly digital materials in the future, let's talk about how we can take action. I'll be outlining four initial steps we can take, but to be clear, these are just outlining the foundation of the work, which I'm hoping can progress as a community-wide effort as more institutions become aware of the challenges climate change poses to digital preservation activities. The four areas are one, clarifying our institution's role, two, prioritizing for preservation, three, tracking risks to preservation, and four, employing new decision-making methods. The first section is to clarify our library's role as a memory institution. What is our responsibility to maintain access to knowledge for future generations? And most of the academic libraries I've worked in, there is an implicit assumption that we prioritize our current patrons, not our future ones. It makes sense to focus our attention on the students or faculty that we work with now, as they are the ones expressing their information needs directly to us, and we have a clear responsibility to provide support to our campus constituents. The digital preservation mindset is less concerned with current access than it is with continuing access not just five years from now, but also five decades from now. Thus, there is a tension between focusing on the current users versus prospective users. If our goal is to focus solely on present use, then we can keep on with our current processes and focus on reducing our uh, institutional emissions and adapting other areas of the library in order to prepare for the forthcoming changes. If, however, we do decide that we bear the responsibility of preserving materials and knowledge for future generations, then we have to take climate predictions seriously and strive to adapt our practices accordingly. If your library was burning down, what's the one book you would grab as you ran out the building? Do you know what digital materials you'd save in such an emergency? We've been great at building our collections, our digital collections over the last two decades, but do we ever go back and assess if everything is still worth keeping? How many materials fall outside of our collection policy? How many were digitized only because a donor requested it? Digital preservation requires a commitment to energy and resources, and we will have to increase these resources if we want to try and make materials available through what may be the dark ages of modernity. To do this effectively, we need to be able to select the materials that really warrant this extra expenditure, materials that are most at risk of loss, and collections that would be important for generations that are living in a much more turbulent world. Last summer, I started exploring climate change as a threat to preservation activities. As I dug into my research questions, I realized that there are so often several notable and relevant reports and articles published each week that underscore the increased need for preservation planning and that keeping on top of them would be a considerable amount of work. I also realized that there was potential for broadening the knowledge base on climate change effects throughout the digital preservation field. So I established the NDSA Climate Watch Working Group with the primary aim of reviewing recent climate change literature and highlighting its importance to the field through regularly published annotated bibliographies. 
I'm hoping that this effort will provide the knowledge base from which we can identify the most concrete risks and develop scenarios from those risks to aid in our planning. When I first started talking about the various problems climate change could cause for digital preservation activities, I received some pushback along the lines of, well, we can't predict the future. There's too many variables and too much uncertainty. And while we can't predict the future, we certainly can change how we plan for it. Currently, digital preservation decisions are generally made much like I outlined in earlier slides, by identifying the likelihood of certain, certain future threats and taking steps to mitigate those threats. This is known as the predict then act model. In contrast, decision-making under deep uncertainty or DMDU methods involve proposing plans and then iteratively testing them against a wide variety of potential futures. The suite of DMDU tools has seen recent uptake by local water authorities, transportation planning, and other agencies in charge of infrastructure. Deep uncertainty occurs when there is no knowledge of or consensus on the likelihood of future events and the effects of actions taken. The basic DMDU principles are, consider multiple futures in your planning and use them to stress test your plans. Seek robust plans that perform well over many futures. Create plans that are flexible and adaptive and use analytics to explore options and futures. Four examples of DMDU methods include scenario planning, adaptive pathways, robust decision-making, and decision scaling. I don't have time in this presentation to go into detail uh, on any of them, but I am hoping to present on more in-depth application in the future and also want to encourage others to explore not only these methods, but their approach to decision-making. Before I finish, I want to highlight what I see as one of the greatest risks we face, and that is letting our biases prevent action. The biases listed here factor into why we haven't made much progress in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, and they are also likely to be a factor in why we don't adequately prepare for the effects of climate change. It's also possible that, possible that some of these came up for you while listening to this presentation. So it's a good idea to examine the thoughts and feelings you've experienced since you started watching and see if any of these biases are at play. The normalcy bias leads people to discount or disbelieve threat warnings that don't fit in with their normal experience of the world. This is often at play when people don't evacuate during a hurricane. Instead of preparing for worst case scenarios, they underestimate them. Confirmation bias means that people seek information that confirms their current beliefs. If you currently believe that climate change is not something you're going to experience in your lifetime, then you're less likely to attribute the heat waves, more powerful hurricanes, and increased tornado activity to climate change. Another related bias to this uh, not listed here is shifting baseline. It's becoming normal to have heat waves every, su every summer, thus people don't grasp how much the weather has actually changed over time. The present bias means that humans are more likely to prioritize the short term over the long term. Our digital materials don't seem like they are at risk in the short term, so it's easy not to expend the additional resources needed to secure them for the long term. The status quo bias entails an unwillingness to take action because it involves effort and uncertainty. It is easier to maintain the status quo than to try to prepare for an uncertain future. Lastly, the bearer of bad news. This can be thought of as the don't shoot the messenger bias. People don't like hearing bad news, so there's a tendency to transfer the dislike of the news to the person delivering it. This can cause hesitancy to bring up these issues, which means that they aren't as likely to be seriously discussed and engaged with. I personally have been called all doom and gloom when simply trying to suggest that we need to take climate change into planning considerations. We can't accurately plan for the future without taking a hard, honest look at how climate change and its effects, not only on the weather, but also on agriculture, the economy, and the socio-political landscape are going to affect us. The primary goal of this presentation is to shine light on how these problems 
will affect our ability to preserve digital materials and thus promote discussion on how we can plan for what is going to be a very drastically different future. Thank you for listening and thank you to CNI for providing me with this platform. If you're in, interested in learning more about the issues it presented in this talk, I have a longer presentation available from the BitCurator conference earlier this year. I also have an upcoming coming paper talk and publication through the IPRESS conference this September. And both of these resources include many citations in case you would like to dig even further. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or are interested in discussing anything in this presentation further. Thank you.